brothers and their parents built a haunted attraction on the Wildwood, New Jersey boardwalk that would be a landmark on the island for over three decades. This is the story of Castle Dracula. George Nichols was from Cook County, Illinois, and along with his family ran Guess Your Weight and Palm Reading Stands in Chicago's White City Amusement Park in the 1920s. After the park went bankrupt during the Great Depression, George became a production foreman for the Douglas Aircraft Company. After getting laid off in 1945, George decided to take his family on a vacation with some money he had saved. His wife, Anne, suggested they vacation in Wildwood, New Jersey, a place she had lived for a few years when she was a child. So George took his family to the New Jersey beach town and decided that it would be an ideal place to start a business. In the spring of 1946, George permanently moved his family to Wildwood and opened a photo shop on the boardwalk and also ran the boardwalk's first guess your weight stand. By the 1970s, George and Anne and their three sons, Stephen, John, and Angelo, were operating 15 amusement games on the boardwalk and also owned several properties. This put them in a good position to purchase the Playland portion of Marine Pier, a location in which they were leasing four of their most profitable games. At that time, we had several stores that we were leasing from a company called Cedar Scalinger, and they own the pier we're on, plus the pier across the street, which is now Mariner's Landing. We felt that if somebody else was trying to buy it, we felt that we would lose one of our best locations because this was our best amusement game locations that we've ever had. And we put together a package along with the Moorys that they would buy the east side of the pier and we would purchase the west side. In November of 1976, brothers Will and Bill Morey purchased the Oceanside portion of Marine Pier for 1.8 million, while the Nichols family purchased the Landside portion of the pier, also for 1.8 million. With their purchase, the Nichols inherited some older rides, including a 1917 Philadelphia Toboggan Company merry-go-round, a 1919 roller coaster named the Jackrabbit, and a 1919 Old Mill boat ride. The Old Mill had various themes over the years, including an Arabian Nights theme and a circus theme. Getting inspiration from Walt Disney World, George Nichols and his three sons decided to completely gut the Old Mill and use it as the base for a completely new attraction. We used to travel to the Disney World in Florida. He loved the Pirates of the Caribbean. And then at that time, Brigantine Castle became very popular. And then we came up with a concept to put up a haunted castle and it was kind of based a little bit off of Brigantine, part of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and a lot of stuff that we put together. In the beginning, when we put the, the concept together, we were trying to come up with a name. There was gonna be several different names to the castle. And at uh, one point, I was reading a book about castles, and then there was something about Count Dracula, which really struck me, uh, that he was a count, and he was an actual person. I always thought it was just a myth that there was a Count Dracula. And I started reading and seeing his castle, and we took some of the visual effects from his castle. And that's when I said to my brothers, why don't we call it Dracula's Castle? And that's how it's got its name, Dracula's Castle. People would refer to the castle as both Dracula's Castle and Castle Dracula. But the official registered name of the haunted attraction was Castle Dracula. We had an incident with Universal Studios where they sent us a letter shortly after we built the castle. They had told us to cease and desist the name, and we sent them a letter back and we told them they can kindly use our name, and we're not going to cease and desist because we had it uh, registered. registered. And then they actually didn't build the castle at all. It cost the Nichols approximately $2 million to build the castle and transform the old mill into the dungeon boat ride. The creative designer for the project was Fred Mahana, who also worked on Brigantine Castle in Brigantine, New Jersey. Stephen Nichols' son, John, was 17 when the castle was being designed and remembers the interactions Fred Mahana had with his father. Fred Mahana actually did a lot of sketching 
in a lot of designing and then gave it to the architect. He worked closely with the architect too. And a lot of it was implemented between him and my dad and a lot of his designs. There was a lot of stuff that Fred Mahana had that there was just no way to construct it because of what he really wanted to design. And then my dad was the one that came up with the look and incorporate the dungeon boat ride to become part of that with a moat. Some of the other people that worked to build Castle Dracula were artists that had previously worked at Walt Disney World. And they actually approached us and said, we worked for Disney and we're retired and we'd like to do some work on the side. And this one gentleman, his name is Eli Lashley, he actually made the uh, skeleton face outside where you used to go underneath. And at the time, we were doing certain sections of the dungeon because the dungeon was built first. And we had a company who sprayed this, I guess it's like an insulation foam. And we were building the catacombs where the boats would go through. And we did one small section that cost like two or three thousand dollars. So I got on the phone to find where this equipment come from. So we bought our own equipment and then we proceeded doing the rest of the dungeon. And we did a lot of work with that foam. And then it was carved, painted, dry brushed to make looked like stone pillars. The face was just one big blob of foam when it was done. And then uh, Eli actually carved it out into a skeleton with the teeth, the eyes. Another creative consultant for the castle was Bob Dorian. He helped create the castle radio and television commercials, as well as the speeches and sound effects used inside the castle. He also wrote and voiced the speech used for the mechanical Dracula on the outside of the castle. This $10,000 prop was used to entice people to go inside the attraction. We had this balcony that we created where Dracula was gonna come out on. Bob Dorian dressed up in a cape and he came out on the balcony and he performed uh, and he actually came up with the all of what was gonna be said and narrated as part of uh, Dracula. And he came out and he did the whole entire scene, opening up his cape, talking like Dracula, and, uh, and actually had it recorded to give to the uh, creative engineering that was gonna design this Dracula. It was on eight track tape, actually. There were some kind of signals on the tape that activated the equipment for him to do his movements. The music would start to play, the doors would open, he would come out on a um, steel track, and then he would talk, he had head movement, arm movement. And it was a great attraction because everybody who saw that from the boardwalk were so amazed that if that's great and that was a free attraction, what's on the inside? Castle Dracula first opened to the public on the July 4th weekend of 1977, and the attraction was an immediate hit. Opening night was like uh, actually opening a great play on Broadway, and people just lined up. There had to have been maybe a thousand people waiting to get in. And then there was another line at the ticket booth, just as long as the line that was waiting to get in. We were busy from the minute we opened up. The lines that were there for the castle and even the screen machine, which was the roller coaster, it uh, was extremely successful that whole season. The hype was so great. I think for the first five or six years, the lines were very long. At one time, they were all the way out to the middle of the boardwalk and we had a problem with the tram car and they said you're blocking the tram car and you're blocking the pedestrian traffic. So we moved the line down Cedar Avenue and then we got the problem with the theaters because we were blocking the, there used to be a theater at the end of Castle Dracula. And we had to do the uh, lines like you see in Disney World, the snakes and snake them back and forth. It took approximately 15 minutes to walk through Castle Dracula. The first room of the castle showed the full height of the attraction as the ceiling went up to the top floor. Inside, the immense room was a large fireplace with a painting of Dracula over the mantel. Guests were instructed to look into the fire, and as they were distracted, lightning and thunder sounded and the lights would go out. When the lights came back on, Dracula would be standing on the mantel. There you enter my castle. 
castle and disturb me from my sleep. You all shall die. Take them, take them at once. Guests were then led into the prison corridor where a skeleton named Grandfather would be sitting. Yes. The skeleton was later replaced with an electric chair stunt in later years. From there, the guests were led into a laboratory scene where a mad scientist would give a speech about needing a brain for his latest creation. It is, it is this, it's my latest creation. It's almost finished, it's one thing. And it's a brain! Then he's how many brains? How about you? From there, guests would go over a wooden bridge and end up in an execution room. Originally, this room had a sacrifice table, but it was later replaced with an elaborate guillotine stunt. Oh, oh, for this hand. So be it. That guillotine I purchased from an uh, um, amusement show we went to, there was these two magicians there. They were doing acts and whatnot, and they were, they had the guillotine. I said, would you be interested in selling the guillotine after the show? And they said, yes. And we purchased it. And they said one thing is that we promised that never to tell the secret to the guillotine. So we never did tell the secret to the guillotine, how it worked. It was a real blade. It was a real blade. And uh, it had a, actually the blade hit a trough before it actually hit the person's head, it was stopped. But you couldn't see that from the floor. And the person actually was in that thing, fell through. He would just fall to the ground into the bucket. Mm -hmm. And there was a special thing uh, at the bottom of it that opened, but you couldn't see it. It was made out of material, but it looked like wood. And then we added on to that. We added a trough to it that had running blood, and it would squirt water on the people, and the girls would scream so loud and run. Everybody would run <laughs> to the next section. After this room, guests would traverse through a dark maze and go up a ramp, which would briefly take them into the second floor of the attraction. The final rooms of the castle were changed over the years. Originally, this section included a mirror of death illusion. And it was two rooms identical to each other, but in reverse, and it was a the picture frame, which is huge, looked like a mirror. But you were looking in a room that's the same room, identical, but backwards. But you wouldn't be able to see your, yourself in the mirror. And we had a guy on a tray. He was also mechanical, operated by a human behind the wall, that whatever he would say, the, the mount of that guy sitting on the tray would talk. And he would tell the people that you've now become vampires. And if you look in the mirror, you couldn't see yourself. This area of the castle also originally included a live rat stunt. And they went and got lab rats. And what we did was we did sheet metal over top of one area that you walk as you're exiting the castle. And it was a, a steel grate over top. And I think when we started with maybe 20 rats that was in there or 30, and within a month, there might have been somewhere between 100 to 150 rats that was in this. People used to lose their mind when they would walk over it because they'd come down a dark corridor where it was pitch black, and then they would wind up on top of this grate that was all lit up, and the rats would be running around, when they, and people would scream, and they would run out. The rat room only lasted a couple seasons because it became too difficult to care for the multiplying rats. In the 1980s, a crush room was added as the final room of the castle. And there was a guy in there trying to hold the wall. I mean, it was a guy about in his 40s, and he starts screaming. He says, I'm a lawyer. You can't do this. You can't do this. I'm going to sue you people. You can't crush us. And we're sitting up there, and we're just laughing. And then when it stopped, I guess he was so embarrassed, he was totally red. The dungeon boat ride was a slow ride through many scenes of torture, pirates, and blood. You would also see the Phantom of the Opera, a morgue and witches brewing a potion in a large cauldron. The ending scene in the boat ride was a large demon 
named Shamaran. You have brought sacrilege upon the catacombs of Castle Dracula. I therefore place upon you from this day the curse of the evil demon. Shamaran. Although Castle Dracula was five stories tall, the upper area was mostly used for storage. Originally, the second floor of the castle was to be used to expand the walkthrough portion, but that idea was eventually abandoned. He had it all laid out for it to be a second floor. It was actually, uh, the plywood was on the floor, the walls were up, uh, the entire system of the castle was sprinklered, and we anticipated doing the next floor, but it ended up that the room where you go in from turned into the makeup room, and we just never got around to doing it. It was not something that we didn't want to do. The castle was doing so good as it is, there was no need to actually open the next floor. A unique feature of Castle Dracula was an apartment built near the exit of the attraction, which had the same stone facade as the castle. The apartment was used by members of the Nichols family during the summer. The person who actually lived in there the most was my uh, nephew. And my brother John first lived there. He actually wanted that apartment because he wanted to be close to the boardwalk so he didn't have to drive offshore. It had a nice kitchen, it had a, uh, two bedrooms, a, a little baby living room. I mean, it was not something you want to really live in, but during the summer, we're open like 16 hours a day, so you're only going home to sleep. And that's basically what it was, a place to go to sleep. After purchasing the pier in 1977, the Nichols sold the antique merry-go-round to the Ramagosa family and used the area to create stores and a Hollywood wax museum. They renovated the 1919 roller coaster and renamed it Dracula's Scream Machine. Eventually, upkeep on the coaster would become too expensive and they demolished the ride at the end of the 1984 season. They built a deck over the area where the coaster once stood and added seven new rides, including a catapult ride. A short-lived attraction on the pier that caused many injuries was the Tubes of Terror. The Tubes of Terror was a, a great ride, but it hurt a few people and we didn't like it. It was actually invented for the, uh, you know, these things out in the ocean where they drill for oil. There were emergency exits and this guy said, let's make a ride. So we tried it. And at first we said, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And we'll call it Tubes of Terror. So we brought it here and put it, we had to build that staircase for it. But the landing was horrible. You're going, I think it was 60 feet high and you're coming down in two seconds. We had a couple of serious injuries because with the nylon chute that people would slide through uh, would wear out and tear and their foot got caught. We had a couple of broken ankles is what we had. I'll tell you what, I never, I never did it. I went up there a couple of times <laughs> got ready to do it, and I said, you know what? I ain't taking a chance, because I just seen a kid break his ankle. I said, I'm not gonna do this. After a devastating 1984 fire at the Haunted Castle in Six Flags Great Adventure, which killed eight teenagers, increased scrutiny was put on haunted attractions throughout the country. Many dark attractions closed in the wake of the Six Flags fire, but Castle Dracula exceeded fire codes, so they were able to remain open. Besides training our people for what they would say, we had a fire drill. Everybody had a flashlight. There was fire extinguishers all over the place and they knew where they were. And they had uh, strict instructions what to do in case of a fire. There was fire alarms in the castle. Every room was uh, separated. We had a sophisticated system that if there was a fire in the front room, we would know exactly where it is and so would the fire department. And we had a uh, sprinkler system and it was not by code that we were, we were required to put in this system. We wanted it in the castle as a safety feature because several years ago there was a dark ride here on Casino Pier that burnt down and my brothers actually tried to save the kids and they could still hear them screaming and we couldn't get them out. And because of that, we put that sprinkler system in just to make sure if ever, God forbid, there was a fire that they can get out safely. The castle managed to survive a disastrous fire in December of 1992 that destroyed most of the pier, except for the castle and boat ride. The castle survived because of a westerly wind that blew the fire towards the beach. 
the Nichols rebuilt the pier and reopened for the 1993 season. As the Nichols brothers got older, it became less desirable for them to run an amusement pier that required over 100 employees to operate. So in 2000, they entered into a lease agreement with Wild Waves LLC. Wild Waves removed all the rides except for the castle and dungeon and constructed a water park called Splash Zone. The Nichols leased the operation of the castle and dungeon to Wild Waves. As part of the lease agreement, Wild Waves had the option to purchase the pier in January of 2003 for $5.5 million. But this plan fell apart on January 16, 2002, when a fast-moving fire consumed the castle and dungeon boat ride. I was actually here that morning. It was around 10 o'clock. My brother, Stephen, came over to my office upstairs. We have offices above the arcade. And he says, I think I see smoke, but I can't tell where it's coming from. And I came over and I seen exactly where it's coming from. I said, Steve, the castle's on fire. And we dialed 911. Immediately afterwards, there was an officer already running up our steps telling us to have everybody in the office building evacuate. And we were moved to the uh, street. And as I seen a burning, I, I started saying to myself that it's not going to burn down because the sprinkler systems are going to put it out. But the fire just kept growing and growing, and I, I felt like I was dying as it was burning. We had to stay a couple blocks away because the whole entire castle was engulfed. So it was very, uh, it was really, it was troubling uh, watching that burn down to the ground that way that it did. The sprinkler system, which should have been able to put out the fire, had been shut down for the winter. And the fire moved quickly, consuming the entire structure. It took over two hours for approximately 100 firefighters to get the fire under control. The fire was started by two teenagers who broke into the back of the castle near the dressing room and caught some materials on fire using a lighter and an aerosol can. The two boys managed to escape the building through an emergency exit and were apprehended by a responding police officer who witnessed them running from the scene. In April of 2002, the teens were sentenced to three years probation for starting the fire. Other penalties included 90 days of community service, participation in a fire prevention program, attendance to family counseling sessions, and to write an essay apologizing for their actions. The boys also had to pay $2,500 to the State Violent Crime Compensation Bureau. I really don't think they got the punishment that was deserved for what they did. They took down a landmark, and they almost injured several hundred people and it was just a horrible thing. And they got, I think, 200 hours of community service and they had to write an apology letter, which I've never seen. Well, it's not gonna put the castle back. After the fire, the Nichols received hundreds of emails and calls asking them to rebuild the castle. Unfortunately, they only received 3.4 million in insurance money and estimates to rebuild the castle were between 10 to $12 million. For a brief period of time, the Nichols considered building a completely new attraction on the site of the castle. We were going to put up a Mayan temple, and we have, the, we have it on a blueprint and an uh, artist rendering with a uh, roller coaster inside. And it was sort of like a castle because you walk through part of it, and then you ride through on a, um, like the kind of stuff you see in Disney World where it's just slow moving. Space, right? And then it would take you through like uh, the Temple of Doom, and you'd see scenes and then you would end up at the entrance of the roller coaster, which would be inside the middle of the tomb. And then you would get in the roller coaster and it would shoot you 90 some feet straight up out of the roof, straight up in the air, and then out and around and come through a mount like the uh, dungeon had, but that mount would be pouring water through it. As you ride, just before you hit it, the water would be shut off. It had several effects that were scary. It was a scary roller coaster haunted ride. All plans to rebuild a new attraction ended in 2011 after the Nichols lost the pier to Wild Waves LLC after an eight-year legal battle. Today, Wild Waves still owns the pier and continues to run Splash Zone Water Park. The former location of Castle Dracula and the Dungeon Boat Ride contains nothing more than a flow rider surf machine and beach chairs.
Although Castle Dracula has been gone for over two decades, many former employees and patrons of the castle have paid tribute to it by producing memorabilia, including t-shirts, stickers, flags, signs, models, posters, and books. Much of this memorabilia, including salvaged props from the castle, can be seen at the George F. Boyer Museum on Pacific Avenue in Wildwood, New Jersey. I could say without being facetious that maybe two, three million people have gone through that castle in, in the, from the beginning till its uh, demise. So I called customer service for American Express. And she asked me my name. I told her it's John Nichols. And she says, as in Nichols Midway Pier. And I got stunned on the phone and I said, where are you from? She says, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, what made you say Nichols Midway Pier? She says, I grew up in Philadelphia and I lived on your pier every summer. And we had some great memories there of the Scream Machine and of uh, the Haunted Castle and all the rides there. If I could go back there, I would do it exactly the same way it was. It had a mystique of its own. It felt like a real castle. I'm thinking of all the memories and all the stuff I did there. I, I ran thousands of feet of wire for the sound effects because I actually put the sound effects in. I have memories I could tell you about the castle that last for years. Many people, including Angelo Nichols, would like to see a return of Castle Dracula to the island in some shape or form. Although they know the expense and work involved would be immense. Even if the castle were never to return, its legacy will be forever remembered by the tens of thousands of people who experienced it as patrons, employees, or passers-by, too scared to cross its ominous drawbridge. Beware, your time has come. Before it's too late.